Welcome to Disciples Net Church. We are so glad you've joined us for worship. Feel free to join in with hymns, pray with us, and share in communion. Wherever and whenever you are joining us, God's Spirit and people from all over the world are here with you. So let's prepare our hearts for worship. Will you join me now in a spirit of prayer? Your hand is upon your people, O God, to guide and protect them through the ages. Guide especially those you have called and anointed, that the powers of this world may not overwhelm us, but that, secure in your love, we may carry out your will, even in the face of all adversity. We pray as well for those in positions of power in this world. May your spirit soften their hearts toward those in true need. And may that same spirit guide them through the hundreds of voices that call to them to bring them to actions that will create peace 
and bring justice. Lord God, friend of those in need, your Son Jesus has untied our burdens and healed our spirits, and so we lift up the prayers of the hearts of those who are still burdened, those still seeking healing, safety, shelter, food, clothing, and wholeness, those in need within the church and in the larger world. Grant that we will be moved to do what we can to answer this prayer and multiply our efforts as you did those loaves and fishes so long ago. We praise your abiding guidance, O Lord, for you sent us Jesus, our teacher and Messiah, to model for us the way of love for the whole universe. Remind us of all that he taught us as we say together the prayer that he taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, how would be our name? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And it is us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory Will you join me as I read from Luke 14, verses 25 through 33? Now large crowds were traveling with him, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able, with 10,000, to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000. If he cannot, then while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Today's text begins with Jesus in a popular situation. There are, quote, multitudes, large crowds. They are excited to hear what he has to say. This is the time Jesus should be saying, blessed are they, and making everybody feel better. Does he do that? He does not. This is the moment Jesus chooses to antagonize just about everybody. Some might say that Jesus needed a political advisor or a spin doctor at this point. He maybe wasn't playing the crowd very well. You will notice that the last time I preached for Disciples Net happened to be on Mother's Day. This is not the passage that I chose for that day. What is all this hate your mother stuff, for heaven's sakes? 
Well, first, we might remember that hate is what we call rabbinic hyperbole. It is language that is chosen deliberately to exaggerate in order to make a point. But that still doesn't soften it all of that, all that much. Doesn't really explain it away. Jesus is really saying that we put family in second place? He is. And I confess that I don't like it. I recall one passage I read from a commentary on the book of Psalms written by Professor J. Clinton McCann, and he suggests that among the questions we ask ourselves as we interpret the Psalms, and maybe in a broader sense as we try to understand Scripture, McCann says one of the questions we ask is, what is wrong with the psalmists? Who are his or her enemies? What are his or her enemies up to? Then he further says that at least as important as we try to understand the Psalms is to ask ourselves the question, what is wrong with me? Who are my enemies? What are my enemies up to? The language he uses is you exegete the heart as well as the text. And so this question of really choosing to give up things important to us in order to serve God, I'm not sure I have done that yet. I don't know what I would really do. And I, I think it's important to admit that and live in that tension. Sometimes I preach things that I myself need to hear just as much as everybody else does. And I think this is one of those occasions. An old saint, the story goes, stands up in a small prayer meeting on one occasion to give his testimony. And it was one of those marvelously beautiful stories that we can be sure that God writes down in the book of remembrances. And there was note of, of genuine reality in his voice. The listener heard authentic message from the unseen. And when this old gentleman finished and took his seat, there was a young fellow with lots of emotion in his voice and lots of excitement who jumped up and quickly said, I would give the world for that man's experience. And the old fellow realized that he wasn't quite done. He had to continue his testimony. He said, that's exactly what it cost me. We are blessed in our family in our old age to finally have our first grandchild. She is three years old. And if she is not the most precious child God ever created, well, she's certainly in the top ten. There's no doubt about that. I can't think of anything I love more than that child. If I really believed God was asking me to do something for God's own sake that was not in the best interest of that precious child, I honestly do not know what I would do. I do not know what my answer would be. Jesus reminds us that we give things up. We pay a cost in order to be his disciple. Ultimate demands, ultimate loyalty, ultimate commitment, Jesus asks. For what would you give absolutely your all, absolutely everything? Whether it's middle class privilege, whether it is money, whether it is racial identity, whether it is patriotism, the nation, whether it is our political beliefs, Jesus is saying absolutely nothing must be ahead of our commitment to God, our commitment to Jesus. The cost is everything that we hold dear. And my friends, no matter how many things I love, you love, we love. 
Let me just speak for myself. No matter how many things I love, there is something that is actually at the head of the line or the top of the list. There is something that is actually more important to me than anything else in the world. Maybe it's my wife. Maybe it's that grandchild. I don't know. But whatever is at the top of that list, if it is anything other than Jesus Christ, Son of Almighty God, whatever's at the top of that list is an idol. It is a false god. And every false god will someday, eventually, fail. And so, thinking of my wife as the most wonderful, important thing in the entire world, in a way, that's not fair to her. She will eventually fail. And she's sitting here looking at me when I say this. It's not fair to her to put her in that position. And let's be honest and actually name that out loud. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. In this text, the peasant and the king each count the cost. They count how much they're willing to sacrifice and give up. Whether it is a simple person risking being embarrassed in front of his or her neighbors, or whether it is a mighty ruler facing the total disaster and loss of everything in including much life, the idea is the same. Jesus doesn't want to trick anybody into following. Jesus wants us to be well advised and to understand. Sometimes the church, in its desire for what we call evangelism, to bring more people to us, sometimes the church fails here. Sometimes the church falls into a trap of saying, come and join us. It's easy and you will be happier. And we do not talk about the cost. Well, before we end on a totally depressing note about how much everything costs, I would like to remind us all of this. If we choose to follow Jesus if we choose to obey God when God demands of us something that is very difficult to do, and we have to decide how much we're going to give up if we're going to go ahead and do it, counting the cost also includes counting our assets. Counting our assets. If we are truly giving up important things, things that we love, in order to do what we believe God wants us to do, let us remember that that means we are not alone and that God is with us. Which of you would build a tower? Which of you would go to war without counting the cost? The answer, of course, is none of us. My friends, I deeply believe that neither would Almighty God. God knows what it costs to build a tower. Believe me, God knows all too well how strong the enemy is. And God also knows what it takes to save the world. Amen. Though I may speak with bravest fire And have the gift to all inspire And have not love, my words are vain As sounding brass and hopeless gain Though I may give all I possess, and striving so my love profess, but not begin my love.
from within The prophet soon turns strangely thin Come spirit, come our hearts control Our spirits long to be made whole Let inward love guide every deed By this we worship and are free Some of you know that the way we create worship each week is to come together physically with our leadership team to create a special worship with you in mind. But as we worship, some of us physically in one place in our hub in Indianapolis and others coming in remotely like I usually do from Denver, Colorado, and we have others from Belgium and other places too. But as we come together, we worship authentically and our time at the table is always authentic. Our cup always has the communion juice in it, and we always have the bread that we share and take communion. Because when you share with us then at this table, we want it to be authentic too. Our bread and what you have before you, whether it's physical bread or in your mind, we ask God to bless as we come in remembrance of Jesus. This week, as we broke bread together during our worship in preparation for this time, it was my turn to say the words of institution for communion. And where I was, I was alone in the room, worshiping with our friends in Indianapolis. And as I said the words and I broke the bread, someone on the other end broke the bread too, that they would then share with the others in Indianapolis. It seemed like a miracle of modern technology that we could do this over the internet until I realized that isn't this what Jesus asked us to do also? Because the bread that Jesus broke and asked us to share is being broken every Sunday and more times during the week in countries all over the world. It has been broken over and over through the centuries since Jesus first gave these instructions. You see, we become the hands of Jesus in breaking and sharing the bread. As I break it here, your hands break the bread in your mind or physically. Become the hands of Jesus in sharing and receiving this bread. Now, you may be in a room by yourself also taking the bread. Or you may be with a group of loved ones or or friends or strangers even breaking the bread as we speak. But in each case we're asked to be both the hands of Jesus, the heart of Jesus as we take and share this bread to the world around us. However unique that may be and however God calls you to share that bread Let us pray. Gracious God, we are indeed humbled that we are called to be your hands in your heart and share your body, your message, your word, the teachings of God with the world around us. Sometimes we feel so small. Sometimes the bread seems like such a small thing. But this seed that we plant, dear God, We ask you to bless, bless the bread, bless the cup that's before each person here in their minds or physically. Bless each one gathered and help us to go out and share this seed, this grain, your good news with the world. For it's in Christ's name we pray. On that last night as Jesus was eating with his friends, he took a loaf of bread And after he blessed it, he broke it and said to them, This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after they had finished eating, he took the cup.
poured it out and said to them, This cup is a new covenant of my blood poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you tell the Lord's death. You tell the Lord's story until he comes again. Won't you come? What is God inviting or asking or demanding of us, of me, of you? Each of us has to answer that question in our own way. And I invite us now to go out, to count the cost, and to follow and to do. Amen.